So hello and welcome back to another episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast, a show where we take all of the latest news, gossip and events in the world of Formula One and we relay that back to you for your listening or viewing pleasure, depending on which platform of course you choose to follow us on. And don't forget guys, if you are new to the DNF1 F1 podcast or the DNF1 channel in general, make sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube help us get to 500 subscribers. That would be great. Of course, if we get to 500 subscribers, we will do a special Q&A episode for you guys. So definitely an incentive to get to know a bit more about us and to help the channel as well. So make sure to hit the subscribe button if you can. Of course, if you are following us on your favorite podcasting platform, you can watch these podcasts on YouTube as well. But it's absolutely fine if you just want to listen to us on your favorite podcasting platform. You can still follow and subscribe to us. That will really help us out a lot. So we really appreciate that. So thank you very much, guys for all of your support. And of course, the main reason for this episode that we are doing, we we weren't really going to do an episode before the Italian Grand Prix preview, which is of course going to come later in the week, owing to what we've just seen. But of course, the uh, worst kept secret in an F1 right now is now no longer a secret. Mercedes have finally confirmed that George Russell has signed for the team and will join them effectively at the start of the 2022 season to partner Lewis Hamilton. Now, of course, this has been triggered massively in this week. Of course, we had the announcement about Valtteri Bottas going to Alfa Romeo, which, of course, we will discuss in more depth later in this episode. But, of course, we need to go to the headline news, and that's George Russell finally getting the nod, getting that ever-long-lasting wait of a promotion finally coming to an end for him all his dreams are coming true and being realised right now as he's going to be going up against, well, alongside, I should say, Lewis Hamilton. And of course, discussing that with me, my co-host, Mr. Courtney Pine, joining me as always. Now, Courtney, of course, a lovely summer evening in uh, Britain right yeah. now. It's had a little bit of a mini heat wave going on compared with what we've been used to, but um, everything's coming up George Russell right now. And uh, how how do you feel about the news? Obviously, you're not surprised, but... Um, how good does it feel now that that wait is finally over and we're now going to see George Russell in a Mercedes on a permanent basis? Well, yeah, I can't say I'm surprised, but <laughs> I'm uh, I'm excited, to say the least. Um, I've been a fan of George Russell's for a few years now. Um, I think he's been worthy of a top drive for a while now as well. And obviously, as a Brit, you know, I think it's great to have two top British talents in the top team. I'm going to be very, very intrigued to see how the dynamic between George and Lewis works out. I think it could work out in two ways, which I'm sure we'll go into later. But it's too, it's it's a good time to be a British Formula One fan. It, the the future's looking good. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, I remember seeing on the Silverstone Twitter page, obviously talking about the British partnership between Lewis Hamilton and George Russell, and it's something that we'd often spoken about in the past. That would Mercedes really want? an all-British lineup. I mean, let's not forget, it's a German company. They have the partnership with the Daimler Group, of course, German-based entity. We shouldn't forget that even though they're based at Brackley and they have such a rich history in British motorsport, it's still a German team, ultimately. Mm. And, you know, this is kind of something that, you know, bearing in mind, what were we, 10 years ago, it was an all-German lineup, the dream lineup with Nico Rosberg and Michael Schumacher, of course, both former world champions. Now we've come forward to the master in Lewis Hamilton, and now I think it's fair to say the apprentice in George Russell. And and let's be honest, Courtney, this promotion for George has been well long overdue. We've often sung his praises throughout the uh, races this season in particular, but um, yeah, it, it must be pretty special now to, uh, after all these years of clawing away and grinding and being successful, and George has been very successful on the way up, now to finally have that Mercedes seat confirmed as of today, of course, when this podcast is being recorded? I think for Mercedes, like whatever the nationality the drivers come from, I think it's safe to say they have one of the, if not the best driver pairings going into next season. And that's a fact of the matter there. Maybe apart from Ferrari, I think they have the best driver lineup. It's a supreme driver lineup. Um, I think Mercedes are aware of the stiff challenges that await them with the new regulations. And obviously, the resurgence of Red Bull with Max Verstappen. They've needed their second driver to be there this season. And unfortunately, Valtteri Bottas hasn't been there enough to help Lewis. And they've reacted accordingly. And I think if George and Lewis get the dynamic right next season, and obviously Mercedes get these regulation changes right, they're going to be in a really strong position next season. 
Well, this is it. And Mercedes are going to be well aware of now what they've committed to for the next few years. I mean, from what we understand from the statement Mercedes put out, it's a multi-year deal for George Russell. So it's not just going to be for 2022. They are certainly committing to the long haul with George. And it makes perfect sense because, Mm. you know, all of the drivers in other teams, the up-and-coming stars, the Leclerc's, the Verstappen's, who's pretty much established already, um, Carlos Sainz and Lando Norris's, just to pick a bunch um, they're already secured seats at real big players in the F1 hierarchy already. So, you know, George was probably the only one who was still waiting for that opportunity. Now he's going to get that. What are you expecting from George Russell? Are we expecting more of what we saw from Sakir, where, of course, he bested Bottas on the day and impressed so many people in a race that, you know, on another day he would have definitely won? but there's going to be a lot of pressure for him to deliver that kind of performance week in, week out. The question is, can he handle it? I think it's, it could work out in two ways, as I said earlier. I think, first of all, this is how I expect it to work out. I think he'll use the first year to settle in at Mercedes. And I do think that Lewis will be teaching him how to be in a team of this size and all that. I think you, you can tell that Lewis is happy to have someone like George around. But at the same time, he's going to be aware of how talented George is. And George... He, George will definitely be a threat to Lewis. George has the ability to beat... I do believe George has the ability to beat Lewis on a given day. It's just whether he'll be able to do it on a consistent basis. But I feel that in the first season, I think George will play that support role whilst he's learning things at Mercedes. I think maybe in 2023. It all depends on how competitive the car is. But I think going into 2023 in particular, I think George will be like looking to take that step to be the top guy at Mercedes because I do think this contract that Lewis has with Mercedes will be the last. So it'd be, which is 2023, isn't it? The last season. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I do think that 2022 will be a season for George to settle in. And I think he'll be getting trained to be the top guy. And then maybe in 2023, he'll probably push Lewis more. And then we'll see where we go from there. But I do believe that they're, they're, they're training him up to be the top guy once Lewis leaves Formula 1. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, from what we've seen of George Russell, particularly on a Saturday, he's certainly got the speed um, over one lap. It's a case of whether he can sustain it over the course of the race, which, you know, in fairness, has not necessarily been one of George's strong points in Formula 1, at least as far as uh, when his experiences in the Williams are concerned. But of course, um, you know, despite those issues and a few rookie mistakes that he's made, that he's obviously called amateur, he's certainly learnt for them. And it's been a lot more solid this season, which has seen him score points on two, on a few occasions this season. And of course, getting his first podium in um, strange circumstances. But nonetheless, he put himself in that position. So, you know, you can take that for what, it, what it's worth. But um, what I'm curious to ask, Courtney, is, uh, and talk about a little bit, is the manner in which Mercedes went about Uh, making this decision now this has always been the stumbling block for them over the last few years because um i read that uh, i think i read on a few twitter pages that this is the first driver that mercedes have have promoted from their driver academy into the main seat now technically that is sort of true um and it isn't and this is me being a bit of a nerd on this one but technically speaking (laughs) lewis hamilton was a part of a mercedes Ben's mm. Driver Academy, although it was partnered with McLaren, it still was part of the Mercedes group. And you can even go further back as to Michael Schumacher was signed up as a Mercedes Benz driver back in his uh, early DTM days when he drove the prototype. And of course, uh, back even for him, Mercedes had a contract with him that he would drive a Mercedes Formula One car if they had a Formula One team when Michael was in there. Um, but they didn't have a team at the time. Obviously, it took until Mercedes returned to Formula One back in 2010 when they signed Michael Schumacher to come back from his sabbatical as, as it was. So, um, yeah, I, I'm going to, I mean, not to be nerdy on that one, but technically George isn't the first Mercedes driver. I do want to get that through to be put through. But in the modern era, in the modern way that we understand um, uh, racing driver academies in Formula One, I suppose you could say, yes, technically it is. Um, but what I'm curious to ask on this, Courtney, is, as I said, Mercedes have been mulling over this decision for a long time now. Of course, they've had issues with other drivers where Esteban Ocon looked like he was going to be a Mercedes driver. It never really worked out. And even though he's still on the books at Mercedes, he's very much committed to Alpine now for the for the foreseeable future. 
Um, and, you know, on top of all of that, they had a known entity in Valtteri Bottas. So for many years now, whilst George Russell was being tipped to be a star of the future, it was always a case of what has he got to do in the equipment that he has to get the nod? And year after year after year, Mercedes went with Valtteri Bottas purely because they knew what he was about. He's a multiple Grand Prix winner. Um, he's been very, very much a solid number two driver and more often than not has kept Lewis Hamilton on his toes, particularly in qualifying, it must be said, although the race has been a bit of a different story. But um, you weigh all of that up and you've got a very solid driver in Valtteri, Valtteri Bottas in the same way that Rubens Barrichello was for Michael Schumacher and David Coulthard was for Mika Hakkinen. And, you know, those are just to name a few examples. No disrespect to those guys who were very, very good in their own right. But um, it's kind of a case of when you've got something that works and has delivered so much success for you, there's never really an urgent need to change that, especially when you've got a hot shot like George Russell waiting in the wings. I think a couple things have helped Mercedes make their decision. I think, first of all, the circumstances have changed at the front of the grid, with Red Bull becoming a lot more competitive. Um, if you have a look through Valtteri's time with Mercedes, there was a, a single driver challenge from uh, Sebastian Vettel in 2017-2018. But they've never come across a challenge as tough as what they've experienced in this season with somebody as supremely talented as Max. And Valtteri's confidence has taken a knock in recent season, constantly getting beaten by a team. It doesn't matter how good your teammate is. If you're constantly getting beaten, it does knock your confidence. And I think Valtteri's form has dipped slightly. Along with the challenge, the Red Bull come along. I think Mercedes have realised they need to try something new. And George's performances, not only for Williams, but that performance he put in his secure, where he should have won that race. Let's 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 be real here. He should have won the race. He fit in. He fit in that car. He adapted to that car so well. Like let, let's not forget, he, he he overtook Valtteri. He was beating Valtteri before the incident. So I just think that the pressure that George has put on as well. How could they let somebody like George go? Because George would have every right to say, you know what, guys, if you're not going to sign me up next season, I'm going to start looking elsewhere. Someone like Red Bull would take him like that. That's how good this guy is. So yeah. really, the two, the, the pressure from George, not only from his performances, but obviously politically, other teams would be interested. And Valtteri's dip in form and Red Bull's form. For me, it's made sense for a while now for this move to happen. So, you know, on top of George's performances being obviously uh, by far the best that they've been this season, not just the qualifying, but the race pace as well has been very, very good. And of course, getting over the line with those points, um, Valtteri's pace by contrast, he does seem to be on a bit of a decline compared to how he was uh, when he kind of reinvented himself old Valtteri 2.0 from a couple of years ago. And it's never really turned into a sustained title challenge of any form. Um and on top of everything else, do you think that perhaps the thought that perhaps a team like Red Bull or Ferrari or someone else might nab George Russell if Mercedes held him back any longer was a huge factor in getting this deal done now? It would have been a factor because any of those teams would snap him up given the opportunity. I think he's one of the best young drivers coming through. And yeah, we've got the likes of Max Verstappen, Charles Leclerc. But I think, I think George Russell can challenge these guys with the right equipment. So there's no reason why other big teams won't be looking at it. No, definitely true. Um, I mean, let us know what you think, guys, on that one. Um, you know, do you think if Mercedes hadn't signed George Russell uh, for 2022, do you think he might have gone elsewhere or looked at options in other teams? You know, it's certainly possible, especially with the shake-up as well, uh, of the regulations. There's no guarantee that um, George Russell is going to be going into a championship winning car next yeah. year, even though we all assume that he, he very much will be. There's certainly no guarantee. I mean, for all we know, he can end up in the Mercedes that falls back into the midfield like it did uh, 10 years ago. And the Williams that he's leaving could turn into a championship contender. Unlikely, but certainly isn't impossible. I already, I already know who's going to ace those regulation changes. I've said it, it's going to be Ferrari. Watch out for Ferrari next season. Watch. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly, heard it here first. I certainly hope that you're right. Um, but, you know, we, you know what it is with Ferrari. They always put out loads and loads of news of all these amazing innovations, like the engine, of course, that they've decided to go with for next season um, on top of other things and everything else. And, yeah, it's nice on a piece of paper and it looks great when they're all talking about it. But as a Ferrari fan, as long as I've been one, 
I'll wait and see what type of Ferrari rolls out next season before I get my hopes up. Um, 2018, 2019 was very much raw in my system and they turned up with an amazing car in pre-season testing and they were completely nowhere in the early part of that season. Um, so yeah, I won't get my hopes up too much on them. But look, we're getting sidetracked a little bit. So um, one thing I do want to mention with this George Russell story, you know, it's an incredible story of how hard he's had to work. Of course, we've gone from George Russell using PowerPoint presentations to get into a Williams seat a couple of years ago. Now he's in the Mercedes seat. Um, I mean, it must have been one hell of a PowerPoint presentation to Toto Wolf to get George in there. But um, he's certainly going to be there now. Um, he will never live that down. It's a great story, I must say. But um, you know what? That's yeah. another point actually I wanted to make about George's move to Mercedes. If you think about, it, if you look back a couple of years, he would have seen Lando Norris in a decent McLaren, Alex Albon at a top team like Red Bull, and he beat the pair of them easily in F two. So that must have been frustrating for him. And I reckon in and around that time, that's when he would have started putting pressure on Mercedes to get that second seat. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean. Look, you you can make the case based on that as a direct comparison, and people often have. We have certainly with George Russell just to prove how good he is. Um, but the problem is, is that that was what back in was it twenty twenty? Well, it was before that, wasn't it? About twenty eighteen. It was because mm. this is third season, so um, it's very easy to make that comparison in twenty eighteen when George dominated the F two championship. But so much has changed. I mean, look at how good Lando Norris has become this season. He is certainly not the driver he was in the first two seasons. And I, I know George isn't either, and neither is Alex. But, you know, it, it's not always a guarantee that the drivers that are going to dominate uh, the Junior Series go on to become the world champions of the future in Formula 1. It's a completely different um, competition altogether. But um, on the subject of Russell and Hamilton... This is definitely the most scintillating and exciting part of George Russell joining Mercedes. Now, of course, a lot of us thought at a time that perhaps George might come in to replace Hamilton. Um, not necessarily just as the heir to the Mercedes throne, if you like. Obviously, as that will be the intention in a few years' time. But to replace him outright as a driver in that team. Now, of course, that's not going to happen. So George is going to get the added benefit of working alongside Lewis Hamilton. And it will be very interesting to see how that relationship goes down. We know George is very much a team player. Um, he very much proved that in Hungary when he said famously on the radio, um, if you need to compromise my race to protect Nicky or Nicholas Satifi, then do it. Of course, it didn't come to that for Williams, but it just shows that George is definitely playing 4D chess, if you like, on... Uh, the overall team game, which will be music to Mercedes is because that's what they will want in the next couple of years. With that all being said, though, are we expecting George Russell to just be the team player or are we expecting George Russell to bring that heat, bring that intensity, perhaps cause a little bit of a rift and a divide, perhaps in the same manner that Charles Leclerc kind of did in a subtle manner at Ferrari um, when he first joined there to bring Mercedes perhaps not necessarily back to the way it was in 2016 with Rosberg and Hamilton, because that was frictitious as much as I'd ever seen in any team in the sport for a long, long time. But certainly going to be a lot more divided between them two than Bottas has certainly made it, because that doesn't come naturally to Bottas. But in George, there's that dark side to him mm. in a good way, but that you kind of need to get control. I think it all depends on how the season starts, because, look, Lewis's form could start to decline in the coming seasons. He's 36, he'll be 37. He'll be 37 at the start of next season. And if his form starts to decline and George starts well, say, say George, I don't know, say George gets like a decent point of advantage over Lewis in the first two, three races and they're in a championship battle with Charles Leclerc at Ferrari. George would have every right to say, look, guys, I know Lewis is the top guy. He's a seven-time world champion. But... If you want us to win this championship, you need to be given me the advantage because at the end of the day, I have the points advantage right now. And he'll, have, he'll gain that confidence. So it all depends on hypothetical situations. If Joel starts well, then you'll probably start seeing him sort of, you know, getting his shoulders out in and around the team. I certainly hope so. Um, and I don't think for a second, me personally, I don't think for a second that George Russell is going to be going to Mercedes now that he's got that multi-year contract locked in. It's not like he's fighting for a, a year contract extension that exactly. Valtteri Bottas was every year. 
Um, so, you know, not to imply that Valtteri Bottas was literally um, held to ransom over his future, that he had to play ball every, every time, although it might have seemed that way in the past. Um, I don't think that sort of thing come naturally to Bottas. Like, he was defiant a few times. He said on the radio famously, the old one in Australia a couple of years ago, to who it may concern and then F you. Um, you know, and, and there are a few times where Bottas got his shoulders. I mean, like he did at uh, the Dutch Grand Prix. Um, they said to him, abort the fastest lap attempt. Um, and he sort of did, but he still set a new fastest lap anyway. And uh, he said he was just having a bit of fun and that he was he knew he was going. So he just thought he'd have a little bit of fun with him, knowing that Lewis was going to get not? it. bit risky when you think about it. Um, not that there's anything Mercedes could have done to him, really. They couldn't just say, oh, well, you're gone. Like, he's going anyway. Um you know, we, but you yeah. know what that 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 could that could come into play towards the end of the season. Yeah, he'll want to be um, supporting uh, Lewis to win the championship. But he might he might just have one of those moments where actually in a moment, he'd be like, fuck it, I'm going to go for fastest lap, or if there's a win available, I'm going to go for it. I have I have nothing to hold me back anymore, and that that could be a possibility. You know. Yeah, I mean, if we're in a situation where Valtteri's a long, long way ahead. I don't think we're going to see Mercedes on the radio tell him to drop 30 seconds to let Lewis Hamilton no. pass for the win. Um, I'm not expecting what a uh, similar f- thing to what Ferrari did in uh, the Austrian Grand Prix 20 years ago, if anyone remembers that, and they did it the year afterwards as well. Um, yeah, I'm not expecting Mercedes to do that. Um, but, you know, as I said, like, you know, I really, really hope George Russell really does get the elbows out a little bit, not to ruffle the feathers, but to, you know, to say to Mercedes and to say to Lewis Hamilton, look, you're the master, I'm the next guy in line, but I'm not here to hang around until you go. I'm going to take over as soon as I can. And I think George has to do that because if he doesn't, then what happens when Mercedes sign a Hamilton replacement? Who is that going to be? You know, that could potentially be someone that might have similar aspirations to George Russell, might be a young driver, maybe someone he's competed with already in the past that knows a lot about him. Maybe, you know, so... You know, I feel like George has to do something um, when he gets there straight away. He can't afford to just fall in like Bottas did. Um, we'll have to wait and see. I mean, if you were George Russell, called me, and you've got this seat for Mercedes and, you know, everything that comes with it, what would you do in the first race of the season? Would you, you know, look to try and find your way and support Lewis? Or would you just say, look, I need, I'm going to take over I don't care if it's the seven-time world champion or possibly eight-time world champion if he wins this season. Um, I'm going to take over. I'm the future. Well, I think every Formula 1 driver wants to be number one. And I think primarily all they can do is focus on their own game, be the best version of themselves that they can be, and then see what he can do on track. This is what I mean. So if he if he starts well, he does have a right to say, look, I've started well here. Please give me the support. But if he starts, shall we say, modestly, then he will go down the road of learning how to be in the top team, giving valuable data to the team and supporting Lewis in a another championship battle. So again, it all depends. It all depends on how the season starts with George. Yeah. I mean, not to stir the pot, but this is going to give Lewis Hamilton a lot to think about because mm-hmm. it's no secret that Lewis, if he had the choice... I would say he most likely would have kept Bottas on for at least another year. Um, It's no secret that Lewis has benefited and very much enjoyed and flourished in the partnership that he and Valtteri Bottas have created together. And Valtteri played a huge part in that and a lot of credit must go to him for the role he played in that. Whether he intended to be the supporting role for Lewis Hamilton, I don't think that was the case. And Mercedes certainly wouldn't have treated him like that at first. But um, once he accepted his position in the team... Mercedes and the harmony that come with that it worked a treat for Lewis Hamilton um, and, and that's what all the greats want you know Michael Schumacher had it for a long time in his Ferrari career Ferrari actually went to amazing lengths to make sure that Michael Schumacher never had a teammate not not, not a teammate that could challenge him on, on pace they he had those but not one that could create a divide in the team that would distract him mm. from their ultimate goal, which was to win the Constructors' Championship and to, for Michael to win the Drivers' Championship. And the same can be said at other drivers like Senna, Prost in the past as well. And of course, as we've seen when they those drivers get together, um, it becomes an absolute nightmare unless you've got a car that dominates the field in the way that they had. Um, so, you know, it, it, there's a lot of things that Lewis has had to say on the Bottas subject, but he's been very much um, praising George Russell now 
and saying a lot of good things about George and looking forward to welcoming him into the team. Again, not to stir the pot, but is this just going through the regular motions of trying to start on the best front uh, with your new teammate? Of course, he's, you know, Lewis is very well known that this guy is de- certainly going to want to make his um, impression in the team as soon as he can. Um, but could we see Lewis Hamilton try to turn this into a master-student relationship with George Russell? Or do you feel that he needs to go with that, that way to a degree, but always make sure that he is still the top dog at the team until he decides to call it a day? Again, it all depends on how the season starts. I'm so excited for this new season, Adam. Seriously, obviously, own obviously the new reg- uh, regulations. We don't know. We seriously, on- honestly, guys, if you're not massively into like the ins and outs of Formula One, we cannot stress how exciting next season is, season is going to be. We've got brand new cars. We have no idea what the pecking order is going to be, and we've got a potentially dynamite pairing between George Russell and Lewis Hamilton. And we have no idea how this season is going to start. And we have no idea how this dynamic between the two is going to work out. No. And I think, you know, Mercedes are trading in the harmonious relation. Oh, that's not even a word. Um, The, I don't know, what's the right word for it? The pleasant or calm relationship? Yeah, let's go with that. Harmonious. Harmonious is is the way to go with it. Fair enough. Yeah, I wasn't sure that was... When I said it, it didn't even feel like it was a word. It was like... I feel like I'm just making this up as I go along. I usually do. All right, all I've time. got you. I've got you, Adam. I've got you. <laughs> Get the thesaurus out. I'm an accountant. <laughs> I'm only good with numbers. I'm not good with words. Um, and then I'm hosting my own podcast. So what do I know? Um, yeah, the harmonious relationship, obviously, that they've enjoyed with Bottas and Hamilton post the Rosberg era, um, which turned out to be a pleasing, um, a blessing in disguise, Rosberg's retirement, I must say. Um, but they're trading that in now for this potentially fictitious relationship between Russell and Hamilton. Um do you think Mercedes will be worried about that or do you feel that they've got a plan in place to make sure that this goes as swimmingly as possible? I think they will be worried because they saw what happened between Lewis and Nico. I don't, I don't think the memories of those years have gone away. They'll no. definitely be worried, 100%. No, they're certainly written in F1 folklore and I'm pretty sure Mercedes, whilst they've enjoyed so much success despite all of that, they obviously won't want to repeat because the competition is going to be so much more intense. They can't afford to slip up um next season and you know having a relationship like that could really a partnership like that could cost them if it's not managed properly um but, but look uh guys let us know in the comment section i should say about what you think about george russell going to mercedes do you think it was the right call for mercedes to promote him or do you think they should have held on to bottas and how do you think he's going to get on against lewis hamilton do you think he can take it to lewis or do you think that, uh, you know, Lewis Hamilton will have him in check for a couple of years and then George will take over? It's so hard to say because we're talking about a guy who we highly estimate his potential, but he's going up against arguably the greatest driver of all time. Certainly statistically, who is still very much, if he's not at the peak of his powers, he's certainly at least 98, 99% there. So... You know, we often talk about Lewis Hamilton oh, as if, as if it, we Very were, it's, it's weird how people talk about Lewis Hamilton, us included, as if like, you know, he is the man. He is the guy that everyone sets out to beat. He is the standard, the gold standard, if you like. And yet it's funny how so many people, including us, talk about Lewis as if like, ah, oh, it's all right. The next kid will come in and he'll beat him. It's like, hold on. We're talking about a seven time world champion, nearly 100 Grand Prix wins, um, you know, the, the stats are ridiculous. The records, the achievements and everything else, it, it's just crazy. So I think we kind of have to take a back seat and just acknowledge um, what George Russell is going to be going up against. This dynasty. And George knows that though. George knows that himself. That's the thing. George does know that. Mm. Yeah, this certainly won't be a walk in the park, but I'm excited to see how it plays out. So I'll have to wait and see. But look, let's move on to the other transfer news that broke this week. And that was... Valtteri Bottas, of course, leaving Mercedes uh, as he's been replaced by George Russell to go to the Alfa Romeo team for 2022. And this, I believe, is also on a multi-year deal. And before I get into the um, ins and outs and the reaction to this, you know, the original intention, I believe, was that Bottas wanted to go to Williams, go back there as he was there in 2013. It'd be a nice little homecoming for him. But Williams weren't prepared to offer him the security of a multi-year contract. So for Bottas, obviously, he wanted that security. That's something that very much influenced his move to Alfa Romeo. And that's what Alfa Romeo offered him. And they've obviously enticed him with the project that they're going on. I don't know if that ceiling 
for their project is as high as what Williams's will be. But he can play a huge part in that. Who and knows? Who knows the next season, no, Adam? You, Who knows? I mean, you, you don't know. I'm only making predictions here as I go along and assuming that Williams are going to nail it. I mean, there's no guarantees. Alfa Romeo could do a fantastic job. We don't know. But, um, you know, in, in a way like what Vettel was, um, in terms of how Aston Martin would value Vettel for a long-term plan or a medium-term plan, if you like, compared to what Alfa Romeo are doing with Bottas, there's certainly a driver there that's... Um, Still of marquee value. He's still one of the big hitters in Formula 1. Let's not forget, he's a multiple Grand Prix winner. He's won Constructors' Championships with Mercedes. He's got that technical know-how, that experience. He's very good to work with, very reliable. And he's still pretty quick. So, he, know, yeah. yeah, so with, with Valtteri Bottas, I think, I think some drivers don't get the praise they deserve when it comes to helping development and setup with the car. And I think Valtteri Bottas is actually very good with that, with that kind of thing. I think he got he got stick for being the Barrichello of the Lewis Hamilton era, but he developed so much with the setup. And I really do hope that going to Alfa Romeo, he can have some solid results. It just won't be seen as Lewis Hamilton's perfect wingman. No, absolutely. And the amount of endorsements and praises that uh, Lewis Hamilton had afforded Valtteri Bottas, they're as good of references to any Formula One team as you're going to get from anybody. So there's certainly more than meets the eye with Bottas. And again, he's still really quick. I mean, he's one of the best drivers at turning up to a new circuit or turning up on a Friday and just being quick straight away. That's going to be invaluable to a team like Alfa Romeo. I mean, we talk about drivers that, you know, they very much build their pace up throughout the course of the weekend. And then, of course, when it matters at the very end, they're on it. Lewis Hamilton is certainly one of them. Um, but Valtteri Bottas is just naturally fast and it does take a lot to beat Bottas on pace. So, Alfa Romeo have got themselves a very, very good driver. Um, and it's also nice, I suppose, in terms of how it was all manifested that Mercedes obviously um, wanted to secure Bottas's future first before announcing George Russell. Because I think it's fair to say those two knew what was going to happen probably just after the summer break or during. So, 100% easy. Yeah. It happened during the summer. Definitely. Um, I, I will say, you know, you've got to praise Mercedes and give them credit where it's due. They've managed this brilliantly um there's been no bad blood there's been no friction of course the press we all want to know um what's going to happen we were all asking the questions the drivers managed it really well of course yeah they let things slip a little bit when everything was sort of in the works and we knew it was going to be only a matter of time but to be honest you know that's all part of the fun uh, of it and as i said i think we should heap praise on them for managing this well uh, there have been other cases in the past where teams have not handled um, driver transfers well or moving drivers on into another team very very well I mean Ferrari in 2018 uh, with Raikkonen was a very good example and one that potentially played its part in costing them uh, both championships that season so you know that's an example of how it can go wrong as a result of that do you think that you know Valtteri Bottas um, now that he's got his move secured and it was handled in the right manner despite being disappointed of not keeping his seat beyond this season do you think that's going to serve Mercedes well towards the end of the season in this championship battle? I think the circumstances, yeah, the circumstances have actually turned out fairly well. I think, let's, let's not forget, he does have a decent relationship with uh, Fred Vasseur. Uh, um, Alfa Romeo has history with him. So he's, he's going to a place where he knows he's going to be, he's going to be supported. And with the regulation changes coming along, he, he might be thinking, you know what? Might have struck gold here. Don't know yet. So he's going into next season with optimism. I don't think he's like going to be salty about what has happened. Of course, he's going to be disappointed. But if anything, it's an opportunity for a fresh start. You know, he's very much stagnated at Mercedes. He would have been seeing the abuse that he's been getting before his relationship with Lewis. So I think he'd be hoping to take those shackles off him and start again. Mm. And we might see a reinvigorated version of Valtteri Bottas, mm -hmm. whichever version you'd like to call it, 4 or 5.4 at this point, I don't know. But um, I think a move like this does do a driver of his experience some good. I mean, it's worked wonders for Sebastian Vettel of late. Fernando Alonso has taken this on with both hands. Um, Michael Schumacher did a great job for Mercedes behind the scenes. I mean, not all the people would think this, but, you know, you don't judge it on his performance alone, but they all say before Lewis Hamilton joined, that a lot of their success now could be owed to the influence and the input that Michael gave them um, and support he gave them. And he knew it was going to be a long-term project. And of course, it's produced so much of a tangible benefit in so many world championships, which of course 
he was not directly a part of, but it's obviously the building blocks you want to put in place to build that foundation, that success story, which is obviously going to be enjoyed in the future. Valtteri Bottas may feel inspired to not necessarily put the building box in, pla- in place for a driver to come along in five years' time and dominate with Alfa Romeo. I'm sure he'll want a piece of that himself. But the, like Sebastian Vettel, kind of bring Alfa Romeo forward, at least into the midfield where they feel they belong, and um, you know try and see if he can compete for podiums or maybe even further, depending on what happens. So I think it's a nice project for someone like Valtteri, and I think he's going to enjoy this new lease of life, a lot less pressure, a lot more support, perhaps run the team in the way that he would want to as a lead driver, which I expect he will be, with the security of knowing that he's got his uh, at least medium-term future sorted. Yeah, like the last few years would have been stressful for him. You know, he's always on this, is this going to be my last year? Is this going to be my last year? And now he can settle down, you know, he's he's in his 30s now. So who want that stability and to sort of have a a refresh because he's been long overdue it. He really has stagnated at Mercedes. Mm. I mean, back on the Williams, I know you mentioned obviously securing his long-term future. Obviously now he's well into his 30s, now he's 32, I think he is. That's right, yeah. Um, So obviously, it's certainly not old, but in Formula 1 years, you'd think when you're at that age, you start to look at, can I get myself a big contract to keep for the rest of my career? Um, With no guarantee that you're going to be in the sport past 35, let alone, you know, where he is now. So... Um, I think there's not many drivers left at that certain age. I think you've only Hamilton and Alonso will be above 35 um, by then. And then you've got Sebastian Vettel, who's very much quickly coming to that as well. So Formula One is very much getting younger and younger in terms of its core age. A lot of drivers well into their uh, 20s and mid-20s, etc. So um, old is certainly not slow. And Valtteri Bottas knows that. I mean, do you think this was the right move for Bottas to go to a team like Alfa Romeo? Or would you have liked to have seen him gone back to Williams? I feel that Williams could produce more in the future. But maybe deep down, he would have felt that a move to Williams would have been a step back, given that he made a step up to Mercedes from Williams. And he's kind of done a straight spot with George. It might have probably hurt him more doing that and actually starting afresh and building his own project at Alfa Romeo. Mm, quite possibly and and like you said you know going back is no guarantee that it's going to work out for you just because it was good for you then doesn't mean it's going to be good for you now um and Williams are certainly a very different team to what they were when Bottas was with them um eight years ago or so so yeah as I said the security seems to be the big factor in this decision for Bottas I really hope it works out for him I think he's a great driver and uh I hope that this is a career move that works for him. Um, One thing I did want to mention on Valtteri Bottas whilst we're on this subject is, you know, the fact that he's moving in 2022 into Alfa Romeo seems like a very nice idea. But in a way, you could rewind 12 months ago um, or even longer than that, if you like, to back to 2020 before the pandemic started, so a much more pleasant time, if you like. Um, And at the time, we had a seat potentially available at Ferrari where Sebastian Vettel was trying to negotiate a new deal. But of course, what we now know is that that never materialised into anything. Ferrari always intended to bring someone else in. Um, there was a seat available at McLaren, um, poss- well, or could have been um, by virtue of what was going on with Carlos Sainz um, before he moved to Ferrari. There was a seat potentially available at Racing Point before it became Aston Martin. And then, of course, you had a seat at Renault, which was going to become Alpine and Red Bull as well. So, Five of the biggest hitters, if not the big hitters of Formula One, all had a seat available in those respective teams outside of Mercedes, of course. All very much viable options for Valtteri Bottas. And um, my question is this, Courtney. In hindsight, do you feel that perhaps it was a mistake for Valtteri Bottas to stay at Mercedes for another year or uh, uh, last season? Or do you feel that perhaps he could have pursued an option at one of those five teams that I've mentioned um, mm. And maybe he might be better off. He, we could he could be in one of those cars uh, as we speak right now. Yeah, with hindsight, probably would have been better for him to leave last year. I think a move to Red Bull would have been on the cars. I think Red Bull would have loved that. Would have been a cheeky little move for Red Bull. We know they like to uh, to take staff from Mercedes, so they would have definitely gone for Valtteri. Um, but then, if you look at that Red Bull move, if you felt like he'd be the uh, number two driver to Lewis. He would certainly be the number two driver to Verstappen. So he'd be going out the frying pan and into the fire if he's a go to Red Bull, in my opinion. But there were a lot more options. I think Alpine would have been a good move for him. I, I think I said it last season. I think he should have moved to Renault. 
to replace Dan- Daniel Ricciardo instead of Alonso. But obviously that that was out of his control. But oh uh, yeah, I, I think he missed out on a couple of um, good moves last season, you know. Yeah, I, I certainly think Red Bull would have been the one that I think would have most likely materialised into something because, you know, Ferrari and McLaren acted very, very quickly. Obviously, Renault intended to bring Fernando Alonso back. And of course, Aston Martin ended up going with Sebastian Vettel to replace Perez, although that happened quite late on. So that could have been a thing. Obviously, moving to uh, the team that's probably closest to resembling Mercedes, if you like, um, in almost every single way. Whilst um, when you compare Valtteri Bottas to the other drivers that ultimately got their seats, there is an argument to make that in none of those, Valtteri Bottas would have been the number one choice, but he certainly wouldn't have been knocked back. He certainly would have been strongly considered, um, at the very least, as a, a, a very, very handy number two option. And that's not a pun at his expense. But Red Bull is the one that intrigues me because Mercedes fans will probably listen to this and say to me, "Ad, if it comes to that, Mercedes would have said no. But with only a one-year deal in Bottas's hand at the time, expiring at the end of the season, obviously having to try and convince him to give him another one, which of course he did at the time. There's not much Mercedes can do to stop Bottas from going to Red Bull if Red Bull offered him a multiple year contract. And this is at a time where they were deviling between Gasly and Alex Albon. So there was no security in that team in terms of who was going to be in that car long term. Of course, they wanted it to be Albon um, after he placed Gasly when they wanted it to be him and then ended up being Perez uh, this season. And of course, they're keeping him on for another year. But there was definitely a seat available for someone like Valtteri Bottas. And with the know-how and everything else that he would have brought for Mercedes, I think there would have been a very, very much a viable option. So I just feel like, with hindsight, perhaps if Valtteri had taken a bit of a risk and thought, you know what, I'm probably going to lose this Mercedes seat sooner rather than later. Maybe it's better for me to get a good seat of someone like Red Bull. He might, I don't know, he might be happier about where he is. I'm, I'm speculating here. This could be completely rubbish and that it wouldn't have materialised into anything, but it does. I think, and also, I think also last, mm. last season, he considered himself to be in a championship fight with Lewis. Let's not forget that. You know, it was between, obviously, Mercedes were so dominant that it was only, the only person who could stop Lewis was Valtteri himself. So maybe the mindset he was in last season uh, distracted him from thinking about moving to another team. Yeah, very much so. Um, it's just something I wanted to speculate. I mean, as I said, timings and that would have been very, very strange. And Valtteri literally would have had to have been like Mystic Meg or something or, you know, Houdini exactly. or something like that to see that far into the future and make that kind of decision. But it kind of does feel like if he'd have taken that risk, it might have worked out for him. He might be in a red ball or, or something like that. Um, you know, who knows? Anyway, look, let's move on. Um, Alpha Tauri, they also confirmed their driver lineup for next year. Pierre Gasly staying as we expected and they're also keeping on Yuki Tsunoda for another season now this was something of course yeah we we, ex- we expected it to happen um at the start of the season we thought Tsunoda was going to be there for at least two seasons we didn't expect it to be a one-year deal uh despite how ruthless the Red Bull driver program can be for young drivers that don't perform we have seen drivers turn up for one year and then go um if they've not performed and Tsunoda it hasn't exactly given them much confidence to suggest that you know, he definitely deserves to be there next season. Although I will argue that I think we're going to see a much better, more grounded Yuki Tsunoda next season with that. It's going to have to be, him. though. It's going to have to be. Mm. Do you think that the Honda relationship has influenced, not necessarily influenced, that's the wrong word, but has, um, you know, inspired Red Bull's thought process on Tsunoda? Um, not to mention the fact that there aren't really many candidates to jump into that seat to replace him as well. Yeah, I think it's definitely played a part. Um, obviously, Red Bull going through that transition from being uh, powered by Honda to uh, making their own engines. But they will want the divorce to be a smooth one. And if they were to take Sonoda out of their driver program, I don't think Honda would be too keen to do them any favours when it comes to developing a new engine. And Red Bull need to get this right or they could find themselves potentially falling apart and even end up losing Max Verstappen if they find themselves behind for a few years. Mm. So the decisions they make in and around the Honda personnel right now is vital for Red Bull. Yeah, there's a myriad of reasons as to why it's important to, you know, even though that Honda are not going to be in the sport next season, they're moving on into other things, it's important to preserve that relationship with them. 
And I think keeping Sonoda in the team, at least for 2022, is going to go a long way, especially, of course, when we have that engine freeze and Red Bull powertrains, if you like, are very much taking over the uh, formerly branded Honda power unit from 2022 onwards. So it's going to be important for them to get that right. And I think Sonoda, we'll have to wait and see what he does next season. Huge pressure. I really hope he can step up to the task, but, um, you know, he's got to have a season where he's not having the crashes and the uh, lackadaisical performances and also um, perhaps the overzealous uh, aggression on the radio. Because whilst I don't believe for a second that Yuki's like that behind closed doors when he's working on the team, it doesn't come across well that every time you're on the radio and things aren't going well, you're shouting and doing this and everything else. And it becomes very boring and tedious very, very quickly. Yeah, you're, you're right about the radio messages. I fully agree. It's a shame because he started well. But I'm not going to lie, Adam. In recent races, I've forgotten that he's even there. Pierre Gasly's put himself right in the mix, you know, with like with top with top six finishes, qualifying the top ten regularly. Sonoda's up there with one of the most forgettable drivers for me on the grid. He, he like for me, he's between him and Giovinazzi and the two Haas guys mm. for being the most forgettable drivers on on the grid right now. And Formula One is brutal, and he has to up his game next season. He has to. Yeah, I'm going to reluctantly agree with you on that one because I like Yuki, but you're right. Um, he's not stood out enough, at least in the good ways. You know, when the times you've noticed him, half the time it's because the rear end of his Alpha Tower is embedded in a barrier or something in qualifying or practice and it ruins his race, whereas Gasly has been superb for them this season, almost single-handedly. But look, there's hope for better things for them next season. I'm sure Yuki will be a better driver next season, so we'll have to wait and see how that transpires for him. But that moves on to the final driver I want to talk about. Now, currently, as we understand, there are two seats left. Haas have gone out and said that they're going to announce their driver lineup for 2022. We're all expecting that to be Schumacher and Mazepin, so unless something crazy happens, let's just assume that is what's happening. It does seem that Williams are also going to be keeping Nicholas Latifi on, so I'm not expecting Williams to have two different drivers, but that now leaves one seat remaining, and whilst we expected originally it was going to be Bottas, now it's not it begs the question of who's going to be. Williams are certainly not rushing this decision and they believe that their driver lineup is going to be announced soon. So there's certainly stuff that's going in the works and the same with Alfa Romeo. And with Alfa Romeo, I'm going to touch on this very, very quickly. It's basically the same drivers that look like they're competing for this seat in Alex Albon, Nick De Vries, and possibly Guan Yu Zhou as well. He's currently leading the F2 championship. Um, and in Alfa Romeo, Whilst Giovinazzi, uh, Giovinazzi technically isn't um, leaving the team, it depends on who you ask on how that's going down. You've got most of the world's media believe that Giovinazzi is not going to stay on for another season. And then the Italian-based media are saying that the deal's done, he's staying. So, you know, that's, okay. silly, that's silly season for you. I mean, yeah. I, I would say the Italian-based media probably have reputable sources, but considering where Alfa Romeo are, but... Until Alfa Romeo announce it, I would take that with a pinch of salt because, you know, from other sports and being a Ferrari fan, Italian-based media have been very partisan to Italian-based uh, sporting brands, etc., etc., and not to, you know, uh, not to bait anyone out or anything like that or expose anyone, but they've sometimes um, twisted the truth a little bit for a certain narrative or agenda, et cetera, et cetera. So as I said, I'm not quoting anyone in particular on that one, but um, I would take that with a pinch of salt. I wouldn't go out and say that Giovinazzi is definitely staying, but it could happen. Um, uh, yeah. in, in, in my honest opinion, Giovinazzi's had his moments in Formula One, but uh, he, he hasn't offered a lot to the sport. I mean, you think about the two drivers that could possibly be linked for the seat. Alex Albon, somebody who did a solid job in F2, deserves another chance. I think the guy has a lot of potential. And Nick De Vries, I think Nick Nick De Vries, he's, a, he's an F2 champion. He just won the Formula E championship. Both of those guys deserve a shot, whereas Giovinazzi has generally failed to impress. So I, I, I am hoping that Giovinazzi gets replaced with one of those guys. Mm. I mean, it could be that he stays and that we end up with a change at Williams, depending on what's happening. I mean, yeah. um, it's important to remember um, that, you know, whilst Nick De Vries, obviously the Formula E champion with Mercedes, he may stay in Formula E for another year. Of course, Mercedes are moving on 
Um, I believe they're moving on in 2023. Uh, sorry, the end of this next season, I should say. Um, so he may stay with them another year, but he's expressed his desire to come into Formula One. He was a driver that f- we thought was going to be in Formula One a few years ago when he won the F2 Championship, um, just about ahead of Nicholas at the TV. So we kind of know what level he was on at the time. Um, no, I don't know if you want to use that to gauge it now, but it seems the main target for both of these teams, or at least Williams, is Alex Albon. Now, it's no secret that Alex's first choice um, of the available options is very much Williams. The problem for Alex Albon is whilst Williams won him and he wants to go there, he's been caught in this sort of tug of war between Christian Horner and Toto Wolff. So once again, these two guys going at it and it's now expanding outwards to affecting a driver who's not even on the grid uh, this season. That's about right. So it's it, it, yeah, mad once again. These two going at it, handbags yeah. and everything else. Um, but basically, the situation is is that Alex Albon, of course, as we know, is a Red Bull driver, is a Red Bull reserve driver. Um, you know, and Red Bull have been very much keen to get him back into the Formula One grid as soon as they can. But they've got all four of their seats locked out already for 2022, which leaves us with potentially one of Williams. The problem is that Williams are powered by Mercedes. And of course, Mercedes have a quite an influence on the team from a technical perspective, of course, increasing their technical partnership for 2022. And this is where the issue comes. So basically, Toto Wolff um, has said on record, he would love to see Alex Albon back on the Formula One grid. However, he has concerns, uh, being a part of Mercedes, that a driver that is currently represented by Red Bull... Um, could potentially join a team that is powered by Mercedes. So he said to Alex, whilst he would like to have him back in F1, he believes it might be beneficial for Alex to leave Red Bull and then he wouldn't have any problems going into the Williams going forward. And of course, he has his own drive in Nick DeVries, potentially that he might want to put in that car as well. Um, And then, of course, you've got Christian Horner with his uh, favourite Karen Wick, whichever one you like. Um, has gone out and basically blasted Toto Wolf once again and saying that Toto's decision <laughs> to try and, and Mercedes' decision to block um, Alex's potential move to Williams is slightly unusual. Of course, I'm paraphrasing this, so don't quote me on that, but it's around yeah. those those sort of words. Um, how do you see this, Courtney? Do you think that um, Mercedes are being a bit naughty, potentially blocking this move for Albon, or do you think that they have their, they're within their rights to do so? Yeah, I mean, you, you could say it's a bit naughty, but that's the way it works in Formula One. These sort of decisions can have big consequences for competitiveness for these teams going forward. And every team needs to protect their own interests. I mean, we see every development on a car get protested by the other team this season. That's what you're dealing with. So, of course, throw a driver in the mix. Of course, the politics are going to come to the fray. I feel sorry for Alex Albon. He, as I said, he deserves a chance in Formula One. Maybe, maybe it would be best for him to quit the Red Bull program. I don't think he's going to get another chance there. If he gets into a team like Williams who could do well next season, that raises his stock in Formula One and other teams could start looking at him. Mm. Yeah, no, that's very, very true. I mean, I think Total Wolf is within his right to mm. block this move if Alex doesn't leave the Red Bull Driver Academy. Um, bear in mind, you know, it's not the first time Alex would have left the academy. Red Bull got rid of him before, but um, apparently uh, Christian Horner was saying that Mercedes were actively telling him to leave the Red Bull Academy or to not join Williams um, and perhaps look for a move at Alfa Romeo instead. Um, apparently he was, uh, Alex was talking to the head of the Mercedes Young Driver Program. I can't remember what his name was, but it, it was someone that Alex worked with at Lotus when he was in their program many years ago um, after he left Red Bull. And... Um, You know, Toto confirmed this, but he did say that Mercedes at no point told him to not join Williams or to leave Red Bull if he was going to go to Williams. So it's all a bit strange at the moment, but I I agree with Mercedes on this one. I I think, look, I would not want a rival team's driver driving in a car that is powered by my engines. It just makes no sense to do that. Um, And Christian Horner, I can understand his concern. He wants one of his drivers in another seat, but if Christian Horner thought of highly of Alex Albon as a driver, as he claims to, well, he's got four seats already that he could have put his mm, guy in. That's right. And, you know, maybe not the Red Bull one, but there's a seat at Alpha Tauri that I thought he could have put him in, but obviously they wanted to preserve that relationship with Honda. So, 
you kind of reap what you sow on this one. And and Alex has said he's got options um, outside of Formula One, potentially in IndyCar or, um, you know, DTM, a little bit more of a full-time basis if it comes to that. So Alex is actively looking for his next seat in Formula One. He does not want to be a Red Bull reserve. And as much as I'd like to see him on the grid, I don't want to see him sitting on the sidelines for another year. He's got to be doing something. So I hope something could be sorted out, but um, maybe this is to potentially Alfa Romeo's game. Maybe he will end up there if they can't reach an agreement uh, between Red Bull and Mercedes. I think in Formula One, it's so easy to become forgotten. You know, I remember there's only 26 available and so many other guys going for the seat, particularly young drivers come from F2 and F3. So it is important for Alex to get himself back in Formula One as soon as possible. It could become a forgotten entity. Hmm. Very much so. And I think he's too good for that. So um, Mm -hmm. we'll have to wait and see. I mean, I was going to ask you what you would do, but it seems like you've already said that you'd strongly consider leaving the Red Bull Academy to secure a seat at Williams. Um, Do you know what? I'd probably do the same. I mean, we said about this in the last week's episode when we talked about this. And Alex, in a way, does have all the cards. Because whilst um, Alpha Tauri don't have a seat available, Alex could use this to sort of man, um, sort of influence this in his own way. Um, he could say to Christian Horner, look, I want to stay in the academy because I like Red Bull and everything else and I feel like I have a future there. But I want a pre-contract or something that I can sign to say that I'm going to end up in um, one of your cars next season or I leave the academy and go to Williams. Um, in yeah, they've a right to do it because in the day he has to look after his own career. He's been, you know, from the, from the time when he was a kid, he's put all this effort and he's had support from his family and other people to get him into Formula One, and he's just kind of been left family in a bat, to be honest. Yeah, for lack of a better way of putting it. But um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, I, I honestly think Alex will end up in Formula One. It's either going to be at Alfa Romeo or at Williams. It's just a case of which one. Um, if Alex ends up at Alfa Romeo. We could see Nick De Vries in the Williams. So those would be my two picks. Um, those seem to be the drivers on top of both teams' lists. So we'll have to wait and see how that turns out. And um, guys, let us know what you think. What do you think Alex Albon should do? Should he try to negotiate something where he ends up in an Alfa Tauri, perhaps in 2020, uh, 2023, I should say? Or do you think he should leave the Red Bull Academy and go to Williams as well? So, um, yeah, let us know what you think. Um, Corny, and is there anything else you wanted to add before we wrap this up? Um, we've covered a lot of stuff on uh, driver we've, transfers. Yeah, we've had plenty to say. So, yeah, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, well, we've got the um, Italian Grand Prix preview that we're going to be recording tomorrow, though that will be out on Friday because um, obviously this is going to come out on Wednesday morning. So at this time, of course, no other driver transfers have been confirmed as far as I'm aware. I'll have to check social media later just in case or leave a note if someone has done. But of course, guys, we're almost there now for silly season. We've got potentially two seats that are left to fill as far as we know. George Russell back and he's going to be in the Mercedes next season. I cannot wait to see nice. how that turns out. And Valtteri Bottas, of course, and Alfa Romeo will have to wait and see how that goes as well. But um, until then, guys, of course, thank you so much for tuning in. And don't forget, if you have enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing to the channel and also make sure to give this video a like if you're watching on YouTube. If you're following us on your favorite podcasting platform, don't forget to leave us a like, follow, and uh, leave us a nice review if you can. That would be really, really helpful to us. Of course, guys, until next time, please stay safe. Thanks for tuning in, and we will see you in the next episode of the DNF1F1 podcast. Take care. See you soon.